that don't know, I'm Andrea Rodriguez. I do the domestic violence program coordinator for the Ponca Tribe. We have office here. And Courtney, our producer, is the criminal justice liaison with Right to Rights. And we have invited Michael Harms from Wayne to come share his story of surviving sexual abuse. And he does have um, a memoir that he wrote, which he does have copies in the back that's for sale today. If you're interested, and the sister will be back there videotaping, so I'll, you want me to turn the lights? This is fine. Um, can everybody see that okay? Looks all right, okay. okay. So I'll let Michael further introduce himself and you'll learn all about him. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, my name is Michael Carnes. I was uh, born at a young age. I was born at a very young age, and uh, my parents uh, moved around a lot. I've managed to find them everywhere that I've been along the way, so that's the short version of my story. Um, I'm a uh, uh, managing editor at the Wayne Herald in Wayne, Nebraska. I've been managing editor there for just about four years. I've been in the newspaper business for about 30 years. Uh, if you name a newspaper, I probably either worked at it or have given them some information or photos or driven through their town at some point along the way. I've had, had a lot of experience working at a, a bunch of newspapers over the years. And came to Wayne about four years ago and uh, just uh, love what I'm doing and love where I'm at and that's a great opportunity and I'm really happy to, uh, to be in Wayne at this point in my life. But uh, I'm really happy to be in Wayne at this point in my life because it's, uh, it's kind of where a lot of, a lot of uh, experiences that I've, that I've had over the years have kind of all come together. Uh, as, the, uh, as it says up there, 37 years in Canada, I was sexually assaulted in the small town of Newman Grove, Nebraska back in the spring of 1976. And uh, it was, uh, it's an event that it obviously has had a, a big impact on my entire life, even, even to this day. Uh, just about, uh, actually, three weeks from today is my 47th birthday, if I make it that far. My daughter graduates from college next week, so I'm hoping at least to get to next Saturday. After that, then it's, then it's all up in the air. I was born at a, at a young age, and, and uh, I was always a happy kid when, when we were first starting out. Uh, a really ignorant fashion sense back in the day, and uh, the flood never did come, but uh, I was prepared for it. <laughs> and uh, you know, mom, and, mom and dad were always, uh, always taking pictures of me, and, and I uh, uh, just you know, loved, loved being a kid back in, in those days. And, I've always had a love for sports and had a dream of playing professional sports at, at uh, some point in my life. Unfortunately, uh, I, I lacked pretty much all of the requirements to, in order to be a professional athlete, particularly you know, ones concerning size, speed, strength, and skill. Other than that, I, I had a great career uh, plan as a, as a, somewhere in professional sports. But uh, all the happiness and everything that I experienced changed on, in March of 1976. I was uh, in fourth grade at, uh, in Newman Grove, we just moved there about a year before and had, had uh, uh, developed some, some nice friendships along the way. And, and we were outside one, one day hanging out doing what nine-year-old kids do in 1976, which is basically talking about bikes and baseball and, and uh, you know, just other redundant things that, uh, you know, that nine-year-old kids talk about. But all right, one day, uh, this guy, his name is Bill Dickey. He's the older brother of a classmate of mine. He happened upon uh, our little group there and uh, took my bike from me and started riding it around. And, and he's a much bigger guy than I was. I uh, was a small kid growing up, so I was uh, I was always the smallest kid in the group, and, and so I guess I was an easy target. And he uh, took my bike for a little ride, and at some point I decided that I needed to, needed to get my bike back because I wanted to go home. And he said, hop on, I'll give you a ride home. Well, I hopped on, and we never did make it home. Uh, we wound up behind the swimming pool in Newman Grove. Uh, these days, the back of the swimming pool is also the uh, six, sixth or seventh fairway of the golf course there in town. But at the time, uh, they didn't, didn't have a golf course back there, and so there was really nobody back there, and, and it was perfectly a perfect hiding place for, for somebody to commit a crime. And he basically gave me two options. He said I could, I could either succumb to his uh, desires, or I could uh, you know, basically have the crap beat out of me and maybe be killed and who knows what happens after that. Um, obviously, uh, I felt I didn't have much choice in the matter, and, and I didn't. And the, uh, when everything was done, he basically told me at that point that uh, if I told anybody about what had happened, 
that he would uh, hunt me down and kill me. Pretty heavy thing to lay on a nine-year-old kid. I went uh, went home screaming that night, uh, you know, riding my bike as fast as my bike has ever been ridden, and uh, come flying in the house. And my mom and my sister had been out looking for me. That's my sister back there, by the way, in case everybody's wondering who the strange person is back there. Uh, they basically had been looking for me, and my mom said at some one point they actually had gone past the swimming pool. They were ten feet away from me, and didn't uh, didn't realize it. I came came home that night, told my mom what had happened, and of course. Our, our whole world just took a big tumble at that point in time. And uh, my dad was working overnight in Lindsay, and they called him and, and told him that uh, something had happened that he needed to be home with his son. He, uh, you could have asked him to give a thousand guesses as to what had happened to his kid. He would have never guessed what, what was, had happened to me that night. We managed to uh, see a doctor and uh, uh, we lived right down the street from one of the local police officers, and he was able to uh, to help us out. And we were able to uh, get uh, get him arrested. He was juvenile at the time, so he wasn't going to prison or anything like that. And back in 1976, we didn't have near as much interest in dealing with with sex crimes, particularly child sex crimes, as we do today. Uh, he basically got what could be generously called a slap on the wrist. Uh, was uh, given uh, probation. His probation officer was a local minister. Uh, at some point later in time, he actually abused the local minister's daughter. This guy is a real winner. And uh, you know, my, my life just changed after that. I went from being, being a straight-A student and, and just full of energy and excitement and everything to, to literally being a, a, a wild card every day. I mean, we, didn't, we didn't know what was going to happen. I was a target of bullying. I was, I was an easy target to being bullied, and I feared for my life literally on a day-to-day -day basis for, for much of my uh, growing up years. And, you know, the thing that, that I took away from that experience was the last thing he said to me. He said, if you tell anybody, I'll kill you. My parents had to, had to literally look under the bed, look in the closet, look out the window to make sure that, that he wasn't out there waiting for me. I, I was a chronic bedwetter until I was about 14 years of age. And even, even after we moved out of town and moved to another town, I still had nightmares about, about the incident and had to deal with this you know, for, for my entire uh, growing up years and, and well into my adult, adult life. And, and there are a lot of kids out there today that are, that are experiencing that. Uh, recent Centers for Disease Control study found that one in four girls and one in four boys are sexually assaulted before their 18th birthday. That's, uh, that's quite a ratio. And I, I checked out uh, the... Uh, Nebraska Department of Education numbers of the number of kids that are in uh, school in K-12 schools in the state of Nebraska. There are approximately 300,000 kids in the state of Nebraska. If you took that ratio of one in four girls and one in six boys and plugged it into the current numbers of the Nebraska the, of kids in elementary school or elementary to high school in Nebraska, 60,000 kids. That's two thirds of Memorial Stadium. I'd be like one of Memorial Stadium. Be like having Notre Dame come in Memorial Stadium and having them basically take over that part of the state. That's, that's, uh, that's the number of people that wouldn't be, I should say. The number in red are the ones that will, that are sexually assaulted. So if you can imagine two-thirds of Memorial Stadium being uh, full of, of kids who are sexually assaulted before their 18th birthday in the state, so it's a pretty mind-numbing thought. And you know, the question is, who are, who are sexually assaulting our kids? Well, it's not people you think. Parents are, are doing it. Siblings, extended family, clergy coach, a neighbor, a friend of the family, other acquaintances, other children. And um, you know, we talk about stranger danger, and it's a great tool for kids, but 93% of the kids that are sexually assaulted are sexually assaulted by somebody they know. Not some, not some guy that jumps out of the bushes or anybody like that. It's somebody that they know, that they trust. I knew who my, my uh, attack was. He was my classmate's older brother. And what was really funny was two years later, this guy got to be my teacher's aide for my uh, sixth grade gym class. I'd never heard my mom drop an F-bomb before that day until she found out that, that her, her son was, was in, that, in that predicament. And uh, she went before the uh, administration of the school that day and, and uh, laid, laid some pretty salty language on him that day. I, that uh, <laughs> To this day, I, I'm still kind of, kind of shocked that she would actually drop, drop words quite that frequently. But uh, 
I did uh, get a measure of, of uh, I don't know if you want to call it revenge, but uh, 20 years later, I was working at the Norfolk Daily News. And at the time, the newspaper was, was moving from, move, changing with the technology at the time, they were going from pasting up pages to laying it out on, on, on a computer and sending them electronically. And we had some pages that were done electronically, some that were being pasted up. And one day I was waiting to check on the status of one of my electronic pages and happened to see a page laid out of the uh, county court record, you know, which has all those speeding tickets and divorces and court cases and stuff like that. And we all, we all look at those pages generally to see if there's somebody we know, right? I was like, oh, I wonder if so-and-so's in here, you know? I heard he might be getting divorced. What's, what's going on here? So I was just looking at this page one day and, and laughing to myself. I'm like, I wonder if there's somebody I know here. And I hadn't been in Norfolk that long at that point to, to uh, really know a lot of people that might be in that position. But as I scroll down the list, I get about halfway down the list, and here is his name. Willie Joe Dickey. First degree sexual assault. And it was like I had a sudden flashback to 1976, 20 years, 20 years ago. I got done with what I needed to do there, and I went, went and talked to the county attorney, Joe Smith, and, and I asked him if there was something that I could do to help him get, uh, get this guy a nice long stay in the Nebraska State Penitentiary. Because he was only looking at maybe one to two years, based on what the, the judges have historically given to people in this uh, situation. He was only looking at one to two years. He could get five. Maximum was five years in prison, but he's only looking at one to two. I'm like, how do I get this guy, guy the max? What can I do? And he said, well, he says, I haven't seen, seen this done too often, but if, if you would write the district judge a letter and explain to him why you're connected to this case and what, you know, tell him your story. I had never done that before. It's the first time I'd ever done anything like that uh, outside of talking to family and, and close friends. Never, I had never shared my story before. But I went home that night and I wrote a three-page letter to District Judge Robert Ends and explained to him what, what had happened or what my connection to the case was. And my dad also wrote a letter and my mom as well. We went to the court case that day, uh, the day that he got sentenced. And the uh, District Judge was uh, looking over his case and asking some questions about the case. And at some point in the hearing, he turned to this other pile of papers, brought it in front of him, and started uh, reading through it and he says, Back in 1976, you sexually assaulted a young, a young boy in, uh, uh, when, you, when you were a juvenile. He says, yeah, any idea what happened to that young boy? Before he can answer, uh, Joe Smith says, that young man is here in the courtroom this afternoon. I think at that moment, he may have had his moment of clarity that, that maybe uh, he was about to get uh, judgment due. And the judge uh, gave him a rather stern lecture and sentenced him to maximum five years in prison. My mom and my dad and I all looked at each other like we just won the lottery. And we couldn't believe that we just, we just heard our numbers call. And it was, uh, it was a great, I guess in some respects a great moment that uh, you know, we were able to get some, some uh, form of retribution for, for what I had been through because he obviously had not learned his lesson from what had happened 20 years later. Problem is I was still, still hanging on to the, to the pain and I had gone through a lot of uh, a lot of negative things in my life, even though I had a lot of positive things going on in my life as well. I have a beautiful daughter, and, and I had, uh, over the course of my professional career, won a number of awards for, for my writing and photography and page design. And, but uh, I just had this, this horrible negative sense of self because of what this guy had done to me 20 years earlier. And over the course of time, I eventually reached a point where there was so much negative energy and going on in my life that I felt like I had to, I had to do something about it. And the only thing I could think of was, was to kill myself. And I was living in South Sioux City in uh, 2006, lived in an apartment that was a quarter of a mile away from the uh, Missouri River. And there was a little dirt road that uh, led from, from the uh, exit to my apartment complex down to this uh, station where you could, you could actually put a boat on the, on the river at, at that point. I walked down to that place one evening and I, uh, I basically stood and looked at the water and watched the water go by and all I kept thinking to myself was, you know, I could take two steps and this would all be over. I don't have to worry about any of this pain crap anymore. I can, I can just, you know, be rid of it. And then I started thinking about what, what kind of effect this would have on my daughter. My daughter was in high school at the time and I thought, you know, she, I never, never get to see her graduate from high school. I never get to see her graduate from college, which I'm going to get to do next Saturday. God willing. 
never get to see her get married, never see her grandkids. I just miss out on all this stuff. And you know, I thought about you know the rest of my family and what uh, what kind of impact it would have on them. And so I, I decided I needed to kind of step back from from the water and, and kind of reassess my life and, and figure out what I want to want to do with the rest of my life. I actually took a couple years off from the newspaper business. I thought that was the problem. Uh, turns out it wasn't. It was just uh, part of part of the uh, many things that I had going on in my life that were actually good things because uh, because I have been been blessed uh, with some some creative talent and have, have been able to uh, do a lot of great things with with uh, my work in, in newspaper and also on the internet and have won some awards for it and so that that obviously wasn't the problem there was there was something something else, else to it. You know, many sexual assault cases go unreported. Only about 12 to 30 percent of sexual assault cases are actually reported to authorities. I was fortunate that my parents were able to uh, have the foresight to immediately report what had happened to the authorities. And, and uh, although we didn't get uh, didn't get our justice that day, we you know eventually at some point down the road did. But uh, uh, you know, there are a lot of people out there that are that are experiencing what what I've experienced, and uh, uh, and don't don't tell anybody about it. And a lot, of those, a lot of those people have a lot of problems that, that come from heightened that uh, that being something that they that they uh, experience. And a lot of victims end up becoming perpetrators themselves. I'm, I'm happy to report that I'm not a part of that that group. I've uh, you, know, you know I know what kind of su suffering and pain goes on has gone on in my life because of what happened to me. I couldn't I can't even possibly envision doing that to to, to anybody, to, to especially on the child. I have, uh, I have three, uh, I have two nephews and a niece that uh, are wonderful, wonderful kids. They're going to they're gonna be awesome kids when they, when they grow up. One's going to be a film director, one's going to be a PGA professional, and the other one's going to take over the world uh, at some point in time. She's, she's, going, she's going to, you know, basically just say, okay, I'm in charge, y'all are out. She's doing it now at her house, so. But, uh, I can, I can envision, envision myself doing that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, 48% of them are victims of sexual abuse. So it's it's a crime that uh, you know tends to tends to manifest itself and tends to recycle. Oh, and there are a lot of people out there who are, are suffering, who, who uh, or who are committing crimes who are, who are suffering themselves. You know, about three years ago, or two years ago, I guess it was. We all know who Jerry Sandusky is if we if we weren't aware of him before that day. But uh, Jerry Sandusky. Uh, situation at Penn State University uh, brought a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, skeletons out of the closet, particularly for this guy. He was he was using his uh, youth organization as a basically as a means to to uh, groom and sexually assault young boys. He was convicted of, of assaulting ten of them. He's going to be spending the rest of his life in prison. Uh, whether whether it was ten or whether there's more, I guess we don't we're not, not going to know for sure. But when this situation happened, it really reopened some old, old wounds in, in my life. And uh, as I as I kept thinking about uh, about my situation, I kept hearing about what what this situation is going to do for the legacy of Joe Paterno, what it's going to do for Penn State football, what it's going to do for college football. And, and I was like, you know what? Uh, who cares? You know, it's, what was this going to was this doing for the kids? And at that point, I felt like you know I had had to do something. Uh, and what, what that was, um, I wasn't really sure at the time, but I felt like I had to do something. I was, uh, I'm friends with a, a guy by the name of Travis Morgan. If you guys watch Channel 9 uh, TV, he's a sports director there. At the time, he was in Omaha at a TV station down in Omaha, and he had a, a Sunday night sports talk show. And I literally stopped the program that night because they were talking about Penn State, and, and the discussion was, you know, what's the legacy of Joe Paterno? What's the legacy of college football? And I, I came on the air and said, you know what? Those those are those are questions that probably need to be asked. But the question that needs to be asked right now is, what about the kids? You know, and I told them, told them that, that I had been been through this experience and and just literally stopped the program. I've never never seen two sports sports talk guys left with their mouths wide open and nothing coming out. It was it was quite quite a, a moment, I guess, for me. But I felt like I had to do something at that point, but I wasn't really sure what it was. It's, it was obvious, but but uh, sometimes the obvious stuff just gets gets past you. And I, I, the more I thought about it, the more frustrated I got. The more frustrated I got, the more I felt starting to fall back into some of the depression that I was experiencing when I was in South Sioux, where I was two steps away from committing suicide. And I was like, 
I don't, I don't want to go there because I, I know how that, I know how that story's going to end. And I sought some counseling, and uh, and there had been some discussion about, you know, what, what can I do? And, and we just didn't have an answer. But I knew something was going to come. Went to Denver, Colorado, as a friend of mine, and uh, he and I have been best friends since since uh, he was my height. He's six nine now, so uh, but at the time he was he was a little smaller, and, and uh, but we we've, we've been uh, kind of our, our own creative uh, bouncing off points. I mean, we've we've done a lot of creative stuff together. We started up a web website called Nebraska Wrestling Illustrated that uh, covered high school and college wrestling in Nebraska. And we did that for about six or seven years and, and had a blast doing that. So I went out there to visit him, and, and when I left here that day, it was 106 degrees. And I was thinking how nice it was going to be to go to Denver, where, where it, might be, it might be warm, but it's a dry heat, and it's not, you know, it's not near as bad. And I landed there in Denver and, and uh, got in the car, and, and Kevin says, dude, I got some bad news for you. He says, our air conditioner went out. It's a freaking sauna in our house. Like, great, great. So the second night I was there, I was having trouble falling asleep, and I finally dozed off, and about 3 o'clock in the morning, I was awakened by a voice. And the voice said three words to me. It said, write the book. And at that point, it was like, the, you know, the, the light went off, you know, the fireworks exploded. And, and okay, now, now, I know what I'm, now I know what I need to do. I uh, went downstairs that evening, and, and, or that morning, and began, you know, putting together an outline and beginning to write, write various parts of the story that I could you know, right off, right off the top of my head. And as I was writing, uh, my friend came, came downstairs. Now, the thing you need to understand about, about my friend Kevin, he's deaf in one ear. He had, he had uh, some, some kind of uh, ear damage that, uh, you know, basically rendered him deaf in one ear. And he said, he said he was sleeping on his good ear. So he's sleeping on his good ear. He can't hear, obviously can't hear out of his other ear, but he said he heard something downstairs. And it was me, me typing away on my uh, on my laptop. And when I told him what I was doing, he's like, "Wow, that's pretty cool." And so he got he got his laptop out and he started doing his magic. And about 15 minutes later, he came up with uh, that cover. And uh, I, I told him what the title of the book, working title of the book was, and he, and he came up with that. And, and and of course I was like, "Yeah, that's it. That's that's perfect. That's awesome." And so. Uh, I wrote the book. I uh, wrote the first three chapters of the book that night, and then uh, wrote the uh, rest of it over the course of about six months. Had to do some interviews. Had to kind of go over some facts, some facts that that I thought I knew but I didn't know, or you know, we had to had to make sure we had had everything right. And then uh, I finished the book and published it on the one year anniversary of the Jerry Sandusky uh, story, story breaking out nationally. That was my original goal was to have it published by the opening of the NFL football season because once the NFL starts. But, you know, my, my Sundays are pretty well booked. And, but I didn't make that, I thought, well, if I at least get, get the one year anniversary of Jerry said this thing, that would be cool. And so now, well, now, now the uh, thing for me is to, is to get out and tell a story. And this is, this is one of those opportunities today, and I'm hoping to do it uh, anywhere and everywhere that I can possibly go and try to tell people my story about uh, my experience and try to tell them a few things about... Uh, Especially if they're if they're like being a victim of a sexual assault, that there are some things that they need to know. And the first thing they need to know is you are worthy. You know, the, the big thing that uh, sexual assault does to somebody is that it basically renders them, in their mind, renders them worthless. That you know, there's nothing that they can they can contribute or, or nothing they can add to, to life that, that will make make things better. And that's that's a a huge lie that, uh, that we tell ourselves, and I told myself that for a long, long time. Even though I was, I had all these great things going on in my life, I have a wonderful daughter, I have a wonderful family, and uh, you know, my creative talents had, had gotten me a lot, of, a lot of great things in my life, but I still didn't feel like I was worthy of any of that. And at some point, you, know, you just have to realize that, yeah, this, this, is, this is it. You are, are worthy of, of everything, everything good and positive that you can possibly have in your life. Another thing that people need to understand is that screw the past. You can't undo what's been done. You know, I can't. I can't go and not and un run over that squirrel I hit the other day going to a ball game. You know, I can't. Uh, I can't undo anything that I've done. But I, what I've done is done. You know, once once I'm done with this speech, I can't. I can't go back and undo this speech. 
you know. So what's happened is happened. It's, it's where where do we go from here? How do you, how do you deal with with uh, with life and, and move on from this experience? And for God's sake, stop beating yourself up. I I I tell you what, I'm I am my biggest fan. I'm also my hugest critic. And it's amazing the, the stuff that I continue to hang on to that has happened, you know, a day ago, ten days ago, a year ago. You know, I, there's, there's stuff that I still think about that happened to me that I did in grade school. And I'm like, what an idiot. You know, forget it. Forget yourself. And, and forget others, too. It's the, the thing that I've, I've gotten uh, a lot of freedom out of is, uh, is forgiving, forgiving my attacker. I haven't actually told him this. I haven't actually written him or contacted him or anything like that. But at some point in time, all the all the hatred and bitterness and negative energy that uh, that was part of that experience, what good is it doing me? If I you know, if I were to if I were to say, you know, I, I'm never gonna forget it, but at least forgive what had happened, I'm able to able to, I guess, have a certain sense of freedom. And if something happens, Tell for you know. Tell everybody. Tell anybody. Tell me. Tell tell the neighbor. Tell the mailman. Tell somebody, and uh, you know, and get get some help. Get you know, if it's if it's something's happened recently, you know, tell the authorities. Get get some get something done with this because nobody has to live with being a victim of sexual assault. Don't have to. It's something you don't have to live with for the rest of your life. You know, in the dictionary, the victim is. A person who is deceived or cheated is by his own or his or her own emotions or ignorance, by the dishonesty of others, or by some interpersonal agency. Words have, words have a huge impact on, on who you are. And, and if you call yourself a victim, to me, to me that, that's a negative. To, to be uh, somebody that's been deceived or cheated, who's, you know, who's, uh, by somebody's dishonesty or whatever, that's such a negative to, to walk around with the rest of your life. I prefer to be called a survivor. Because a survivor is somebody who continues to function or prosper in spite of opposition, hardship, or setbacks. I've experienced a lot of those things in my life. Not just with not just with this experience, but with others as well. And I prefer to be called a survivor than a victim eight days a week. You know, a lot of the people that, that uh, I've had a lot, of, a lot of support with in my life are uh, still around today, thank God. This is this is the entire family. My daughter's in the bottom left-hand corner there, and uh, and, that's, and that's the rest of the clan. And, and as you can tell, uh, right there, there's there's your there's your leader of the free world. She's she's got about another 30 years or so before she qualifies, but but uh, I'd, I'd say you know probably the 2046 presidency, she'll probably be she'll probably be running the show if we still have have uh, our country. And then, of course, John's, he's going to be the golfer, and Chase is going to be the, uh, he's going to be the, act, the uh, Steven Spielberg of the family. So, my sister, sister and I, have, we've had a lot, of, a lot of good times over the years. As you can see, my fashion sense has never really, I've never really come out of that. Um, but uh, she's, she's a pretty awesome person. I, uh, I, I also have to, to give her some credit. She's the only person in this world has ever given me a bloody nose. She, she's the only one. She's, she has that honor. She, uh, she sucker punched me in the backyard one day when we were kids, and uh, so she's, she's got that, uh, that distinction. This is my friend Kevin. This is the only time we've actually been eye to eye. He's six foot, like I say, six foot. I actually six foot six, I think. But uh, he's a lot taller than I am. But uh, we, uh, we've been best friends since we were both in junior high school. We went through a lot of, a lot of uh, rough times together. Uh, he was he was bullied quite frequently in high school as, as well, and and so we we both have been through a lot together, and, and we've kind of been, been each other's uh, best friends for for much longer than either one of us would care to admit, because then we tell that tell you how old we are. Uh, this guy here is uh, his name is Andy Seeley. He's uh, actually the sports information director at the University of Central Florida. His mom and dad gave me my first job in the newspaper business when I was in high school, and that was a uh, uh, I think that was a, one of those things where my parents were conspiring to get me some work. Because I, I felt like the first national bank, mom and dad, would take care of all my financial needs, and they told me that that bank was insolvent. <laughs> and so his mom and dad kind of gave me gave me a start. And he's kind of the brother the brother I never had. Uh, he's actually one day older older than my sister. They went they went to school together, and he was at our house constantly because 
because uh, uh, we just we just always had a lot of fun together. And that's his daughter and my niece that are in there too. This is this is the rock that makes me roll. Um, this is my daughter Kylie. She's a lot older now than she was in those pictures, but she's uh, she's only been been uh, been a cutie. And the last thing she, anybody will ever accuse her of is being camera shy. And the camera popped up wet, and those, that face just lit up like uh, like nothing. And uh, this is my other daughter, Abby, uh, on the right there. She was she was a result of a, of a relationship that I had uh, actually while I was living in Norfolk. And uh, her mother and I made the decision to give her up for adoption. As fate would have it, her her uh, cousin and his wife were looking to adopt a baby. Problem solved. <laughs> and she's she's. Uh, as, as brilliant as she is, good looking. She uh, uh, plays in the high school band, and she's, she's an awesome kid. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I shudder to think what these two are going to do with their, with their lives, because they're both going to be awesome, whatever they do. We, we, do have, we do have a tradition in our family, though, that uh, we do have to uh, attend a sporting event, usually it's College World Series, and uh, we, have, we have to make a funny face at camp, because that's just, it's just something that we do as a family. We're, we're kind of funny like that. So, that's... Uh, that's me in a nutshell. That's a big nutshell. So, uh, anybody got any questions? Speaking of the past, don't you owe me five dollars for college? <laughs> <laughs> we can settle that out later. <laughs> Lou, and I, Lou and I went to school together to Southeast yeah. in Fairbury. We went to go. Uh, you, uh, I noticed that the fella, uh, I think the address of your uh, the perpetrator uh, was in Norfolk address. Is yeah. he still live here? He, he still, he still does. It? And in fact, I, uh, uh, there was a story in the Norfolk Daily News yesterday that uh, the uh, apartment building or hotel or whatever they call it over there uh, is being closed for, because of some structural reasons or whatever. And I, I do believe that, that that address up there was was his address. I did I did check the uh, sex offender registry after I saw that story and I saw that he, he had moved to another address here in Norfolk. So do you ever run in? I mean, I know you look Wayne or whatever, but obviously you make your way here. He doesn't, he doesn't attend very many sporting events uh, in Norfolk <laughs> that I attend. Uh, I, I have not, not ran, in, ran into him. The only time I have seen him since, since we left New Grove was the day in the courthouse when, when, he was, uh, when he was sentenced. And uh, it, was, it was really kind of spooky, I guess, because when he walked out, I recognized him immediately. My mom and dad, they didn't, you know, obviously they didn't have as much, uh, I guess, exposure to him as I did. Um, figuratively speaking and literally, but uh, um, I recognize him right away. And I mean, if you know, outside from the glasses and a little bit of gray in the hair, it, it was it was just like you know, just like he looked back in 1976. No. What happened when your mom went to school and? The well, she basically, she basically said that, that if, if that boy laid one finger on one child, that there would be a lawsuit on, on that school district. They, they would not ever want to experience ever again. I mean, I don't know why she didn't, didn't uh, pull us out of the school right then and there. Uh, because he, he ended up, they, they didn't pull him out. You know, I, would, I would have thought that you know, some administration would have said, look, we're going to have to reassign you because, you know, he was there the whole semester. It was I, I I never I never had so little fun in, in PE class than I did that semester because he was there every day. I mean, that and I, I, and yeah, I had, his youngest brother was in my class, and uh, you know I I never uh, I guess experienced anything from him as far as any you know discussion about what had happened or you know give me any crap about it or anything like that. But uh, you know just going to PE class every day and knowing that knowing that that guy was going to be there, that was. It was hard. Did he ever approach you or say anything to you? At, at, in school at the time? No, no, he never did. I think, I think, <laughs> I don't know, I think he probably figured if I, if I did say, or he did say something to me that uh, I might, might have a word with my mom. And <laughs> my dad, uh, told me years later that uh, he had an opportunity to take care of business himself one day. He had, uh, was driving down the street one day and this kid walked across the street and, and when, he, when he looked and saw who was driving the car, he kind of handed my dad this big old cap that he canary kind of grin. And my dad said it took every ounce of energy in him to keep from hitting the gas. 
And he said the thing that stopped him was, was his dad, dad told him one time that he says, don't do your son no good in prison. And I was like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> we won't know unless we try. <laughs> if it takes him out of the, out of the, out of the loop, then what the heck? Well, I just want to say that I, I think in, in one respect, probably the experience you had, you, you were lucky in one, one area in that you were able to tell your parents and that they believed you and took action because yeah. I was at a child protection work for 13 years and that was not the case in a good majority of cases that were, you know, the parents or family didn't believe them or, you know, or they just didn't tell them for years and couldn't figure out why the kids were behaving so badly and stuff. And so you had a very supportive family. You were lucky in that respect. I, I, I'm incredibly blessed to have the parents that I have. Um, and I've, I've seen, seen and heard and read a lot of stories of people who've, who have been through this and, and, you know, they try to tell somebody and nobody, nobody will believe them. Uh, there's a young lady uh, by the name of Erin Marin who's uh, working uh, on a nationwide effort to get, uh, it's called Erin's Law, which uh, basically requires schools to, uh, to teach uh, age-appropriate uh, education relating to sexual abuse. And she's got it passed right now, and I think, I think she just got it passed in Arkansas, and I think New York is all as I think they, they got it in the Senate. I think they got it passed in the House, and it's going to be in the Senate next. And I think that's that'll be the eighth state I think that has passed it. Uh, I'm trying trying to get something like that done here as well. I'm finding a little resistance right now, but but uh, uh, they don't they don't know who they're dealing with. I don't think. <laughs> but uh, uh, she was uh, abused. Uh, she was sexually assaulted as a uh, first grader, I believe it was, by the by the uncle of a, of a classmate during her first sleepover. First time she ever been at somebody's house for sleepover. She gets sexual assault, and then several years later, she was um, she was uh, molested by uh, one of her cousins. And when she tried, she she I think she said she went through this for about like two years. And then one day, her younger sister said something to her that that you know basically told her. Oh my God, he's he's attacking her too. They went to tell tell mom and dad. Mom and dad uh, went went to the authorities and, and it became something where it had actually divided the family. Family would, would not uh, would not uh, invite them over to any family functions anymore. Basically, you know, they took the kid's side rather than rather than her side. And years later, he did apologize to her. And, and I I don't know if there's ever been any any full resolution. Amongst the family members, but yeah, there's a lot. Then you know, that's that's why I say, if, if you know, tell anybody, tell everybody, you know, tell tell somebody, somebody helps you out. How are you able to tell your parents? I mean, he obviously threatened me with that. Was that's a big thing for kids to have the courage? I came running, screaming into the house. It was it was uh, fair, fairly evident to my mom that, uh, that something was not right because <laughs> because I generally didn't do that unless I was in some sort of pain. And so when, when I, I come flying in the house, you know, screaming, and they, they've been out looking for me, and she's like, where were you? What happened? And I, and I you know, right there, just, I just let it, all, let it all out. I didn't even, did, you know, the, the thought of, of this guy having me down and kill me was, you know, was terrifying enough. And then, and then I just, just figured I had, I had to tell them, I had to say something. You know, because I just... I, just, I don't just disappear from, from the house, you know, like that, unless, unless something's wrong, you know. Does your daughter know about the abuse, or do you plan to tell her? We've, we've talked a little bit about it. We, um, I, don't, I don't think she's heard the whole story yet. Um, she's, I've got, uh, I videotaped a speech that I did here a couple weeks ago, and, and I, I don't know if she's had a chance to watch it yet. She's a little busy right now trying to, trying to get her degree done, so. So at some point, at some point I know we'll probably, we're probably going to have a long set. We've talked in bits and pieces about it. She hasn't, I guess, really asked a lot of questions about it, but, but I'm, I'm sure that over time she's going to know the whole story. So. And I'm just, I'm just thankful that, uh, that she never went through the experience that I did. Um, I'm thankful in a lot of ways. You know, my, my dad, my dad uh, basically didn't kill, kill his, uh, his son's perpetrator because because you know, grandpa said you'll do no good in prison. 
I, I guess I kind of thought, you know, I don't, I'm not sure that there's a jury that would convict me. If I, if I did, if somebody had something like that to happen to my daughter, I said, I'm not sure the jury would convict me of it. Because I, I, I'm i sure probably, in retrospect, yeah, they probably would have. But <laughs> at, at that point in time, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're a dad, you know, you're, you, want, you want to protect your children and anybody who, who uh, you know, gets, gets in, in front of that is as good as dead in your eyes, you know. I, I always said back then that the, the cops better get there first because if I get there first, I'm judge, jury, and executioner. And we don't have an appeals court in my, part, in my world. <laughs> Thankfully, we never had to do that, deal with that, so. How were you ever, to, ever able to get to a point where you forgave him? Well, I guess it was kind of during the during the process of writing the book that, that I kind of came to the realization that, you know, I'm, I'm hanging on, why am I hanging on to this, to this anger and everything? What, what good is it serving me at this point? And so I, I, I just sat down one day and just I, I wrote a, wrote a letter that you know if I were to actually send it to him that would be the letter that I sent to him. And uh, I just basically said, you know I'll never forget the the pain and the and the hell that you put me through and everything. He said, but, but, but I do forgive you because I know that that uh, if I if I continue to to hang on to this to this pain and suffering, essentially what I'm doing is basically letting him let, live right free in my head. You know, that's uh, that's that's a big thing. If you if you continue to let let what somebody has done to you affect your life, basically just giving them you know free reign to to continue to to, uh, to torment you and to and to, to uh, treat you neg in a negative fashion, and they don't even have to do anything. All they have to do is just be. Has your family been able to forgive him? I I don't know. I <laughs> I'm not I'm not sure that. Uh, that that will ever happen. There, I mean, we're we're all we're all pretty forgiving people in in, in a lot of areas. But I, I know that what my dad and my mom went through. I know it's something that they uh, they uh, have have never forgiven forgiven them, him for. And I don't think I don't think they ever will. Jenny was probably about what, five six years old at the time, so she didn't really have have much of a reference point to to. Uh, Deal with you know, all she knew was her big brother was hurt and, and you know, exactly why she wasn't wasn't aware of it wasn't good. So, but I have seen the long term effects it's had and the damage it did not only to my brother but to our family. You know, my parents uh, divorced many years later, and that's not Mike's fault. But I think the situation that happened to Mike put a lot of stress and strain on their marriage, um, and. Uh, you know, you can't, like you said, you can't undo the past, but it, it certainly has a spider web effect, you know. And I think that's where there needs to be better education, not only for, um, you know, rehabilitating sex offenders, but also for the, the, the survivors and the survivors' families, the teachers of the survivors. Anybody that comes in contact with that child is going to be affected by that crime. And so I think there needs to be better awareness and education for all of those people that touch that child because they need to know how to handle what happened to them, but they also need to know what effect that has on the people around them. There's a bill in the legislature this year that uh, I, I talked to uh, Senator Bloomfield about, about trying to get uh, through the legislature. It's LB 143. And what it is, is it's kind of a, a light version of Aaron's Law in, that it uh, requires the Department of Education to draft a template that uh, schools can then use to, to create their own um, uh, educational opportunities as far as age-appropriate education uh, relating to sexual abuse. Uh, the, uh, the bill uh, made it into committee. It got, uh, didn't, didn't, it's not come out of committee this year. It doesn't sound like it's going to this year. Evidently, evidently we have school funding issues that need to be dealt with. I, 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 I'm confused on that, but, um, but uh, the, the bill is—it's uh, it's probably not going to be seen in this this year's legislature, but um, but it is—I guess it does have hope for for next year. So so hopefully uh, between now and then, uh, 49 state senators will 